But this one is a special one, especially for the kids that have come from Lee School, because we organize these events so, special, so they could come. Um, and right now I'm going to introduce you to our speaker, but I'll get into some geology, who's going to tell us all about impacts. All right, well, thanks for coming. Uh, yep, you should feel free to move further down if you want, but uh, anyway, but you don't have to. Um, and uh, this is a slightly different, I guess it's, you know, this is the late night audience now compared to the six o'clock showing, so uh, all the kids are down here. So I'll have a few questions for them, but if any of you, small kids or big kids, have questions that you just can't wait to ask, that's fine. Uh, just, you know, Put your hand up. If I don't see you, then just you know, jump up and down. I'll spot you soon enough. Uh, but yeah, if you have a question that you want answered, I'll stop and answer it. That'd be fine. So, um, oh, let me go back to where we should be, which is the beginning of the presentation. There we go. That's better. All right. So, um, I've got four questions that I'm, I'm going to answer. There, meteorite impacts is a, is a, a huge subject. Uh, it's something we spend a few lectures on in the class that, that, uh, that I co-teach with Doc Spec. Um, many of the slides I'm going to show are from that class, which is for seniors and grad students. However, um, I've found that most of them work just as well with, uh, with, with elementary school kids. The only thing is, you won't necessarily uh, want to read all of the words, but that's okay. I don't think the students in the class read all of the words anyway. Um, but uh, the pictures are the, are the important thing here. The four questions that I figured you would all like answered would be, first of all, how often do impacts occur? Because it's not my intention to make you so nervous that you want to wear a helmet for walking back to your car tonight. Um, and the short answer is, not very often, so don't worry. Secondly, what are meteorites made of? Hopefully, many of you have had a chance to actually look at some meteorites already. If you haven't, they're at the desk outside. Uh, we have a few different kinds. And a couple of my students who, uh, who, who should be able to tell you all about them. Another question is, how big would the crater be when, when a meteorite lands? Well, again, hopefully, if you haven't already, then you will have the chance to go next door and make your own craters. Um, obviously, the ones we find on the surface of the Earth are somewhat bigger than the ones you're making next door. And then finally, how can we avoid being hit? Um, so, if you have any, any other questions after all that, we then ask me at the end. So the first one, how often do impacts occur? So, you know, not very often, certainly not, not big ones, but small meteors enter the Earth's atmosphere every day. Sometimes we get to see videos of them. Here's one from Peekskill, New York in 1992. Uh, you'll see it comes in, it breaks up a bit, a few pieces fly off, it's burning up in the atmosphere. And you'll see in a minute that um, a small chunk did in fact land uh, and, and hit the car. So um, this kind of thing actually happens on nearly a daily basis. There are certain times of year when we see meteor showers, um, you know, which are particularly good times for seeing shooting stars. Things that might uh, potentially destroy a city only happen every thousand years or so. And then um, you know, mass extinction scale events, really big impacts that even change the course of life on Earth. Uh, happen, you know, something like every hundred million years or so. It's important to remember that these are average recurrence intervals, we call them. Just on average, something will happen every hundred million years. There's no fixed timetable. We can't predict things that well. The reason that we have video footage of that fireball, by the way, that was a Friday night. It was a high school football game, and lots of people had their video cameras out and uh, took a moment away from the action on the field to uh, look at the bright, shiny thing in the sky. Uh, of course, there was also the Chelyabinsk uh, meteorite in Russia a few months ago, because um, I guess everybody in Russia has a, a dashboard cam in their car, so there were lots and lots and lots of videos of that, which are really cool. All right, so <clears throat> this is a kind of more quantitative way of saying that big meteorite impacts don't happen very often. So here, uh, going to the right, we have bigger and bigger impacts. And if you can read it, um, along the bottom here, we have the crater diameter up to 100 or even 1,000 kilometers, which would be a very, very big crater indeed. 
Um, along the top of the graph, we have kind of approximate energy of impact in terms of nuclear weapons. Um, so um, basically, um, atomic bomb at the small end, hydrogen bomb, and then basically as we get approximately to the middle of the graph, it's the entire world's nuclear arsenal, and then off to the right, right end of the graph, you know, that's just unfeasibly big. The amount of energy involved in a large meteorite impact is way bigger than anything that we can really produce, consider. Way bigger than the biggest earthquake, way bigger than the biggest volcanic er eruption. Uh, the, the single most powerful natural hazard that we face. The good news is they really don't happen very often. And as you start to look at bigger and bigger events, they happen less and less often. Okay, meteorite impacts weren't really thought about very much at all until the 1960s. There was a guy called Gene Shoemaker, who was a very good geologist, um, who uh, spent most of his career thinking about impacts. Um, and he actually had a comet named after him, Comet Shoemaker-Levy. Uh, and this comet broke up into about 21 different fragments. Uh, and it was, it was seen, uh, broke up, and then it hit Jupiter. And this was all um, you know, in the uh, early 90s when we had telescopes that we could take pictures of it and actually watch this happen. This was the first time that a collision had ever been seen between two solar system bodies. Um, so this one comet broke up into about 21 different pieces. Um, and they just gave them each letter names. Uh, uh, this is a picture not in visible light, uh, it is a photograph, but it's at a slightly different wavelength than we can see it, um, of the impact of fragment G, which was the biggest, it was about two kilometers across. Um, and so there it is, impacting Jupiter. What do you all know about the surface of Jupiter? I don't know if the kids know this or not, but what do you know, Luke? It has storms. It has storms. All we see at the surface of Jupiter is clouds. Jupiter is not a terrestrial planet. It has a dense atmosphere, but when we talk about an impact with Jupiter, it's not the same as like an impact on Earth or the Moon. Anyway, evidently, it makes quite a show. Uh, and if you look closely in the top right, you can just see the faint outline of the, the, the still some residual brightness from the impact of the first fragment, fragment A as well. All right, so that's fragments of a comet hitting Jupiter. What would this look like on Earth? This would be approximately what the Earth would look like about 100 minutes after the impact of a two kilometer sized body, um, you know, like fragment G. Um, why it's hitting New York, I don't know. There's just some inevitability that it has to, anyway. Um, <clears throat> but as you can tell, this is a bad day for the Earth right there. Um, not the worst day that Earth's had. So about 65 million years ago, uh, something quite a bit bigger than fragment G, probably about um, a 10 kilometer diameter object, um, landed uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and um, caused a very large explosion, uh, a planet scale fireball, and destroyed the dinosaurs. And this led to, this was the end of the, of the Cretaceous. Um, and uh, we're lucky enough to have this photo <laughs> uh, it's a really nice set of paintings by this guy, Don Davis, uh, you know, imagining what this might have looked like. Um, you can see the curvature of the Earth. This is a very large curtain of debris. Um, looking a bit closer in, there are some very alarmed pterodactyls. Um, here, this triceratops fell over. Um, uh, this Lasmosaurus is looking distinctly upset. I could just imagine it, you know, going, what? And then, you know, anyway. Oh, and this, I like the fish jumping out as well. Anyway. All right, so this is, this is the end of the Cretaceous. This was a mass extinction. So um, th this is a little graph of mass extinctions on Earth. The last 540 million years, the, uh, the Phanerozoic Eon, the last ninth or so of Earth history. Um, and there have been lots of these extinctions. And the end Cretaceous here is by no means the biggest. Um, it's probably the best known, um, partly because it happened quite recently, partly it happened fairly close to us, or you know, the impact did. So in North America, there are several places you can see uh, deposits 
from the, the impact of the Chicxulub crater. Uh, the biggest was uh, the Permo Triassic, and you know, we don't know if there was an impact associated with that or not. We know there were lots of volcanoes associated with it. Since I personally study volcanoes more than I do impact, I'm fine with volcanoes being responsible for that one. Um, but um, you know, there are many of these things, but on average you can see this kind of a 50 million year you know, kind of interval to them, which is about the frequency with which we expect to be hit by something big enough to cause a mass extinction. Okay, so of course I start talking about millions of years, and most of you who don't think in geologic time, really, is that a long time or is it a short time? I mean, it sounds like a very, very, very long time. 65 million years is a long time, it's true. But on the time scale of the Earth, it's not very long at all. This is where I need some volunteers. You too? I can take one more. Would you like to help out? Yeah? All right, so I need your, your names and your ages. Luke. Luke, how old are you, Luke? Six. Cool. You are. Laura, seven, yeah. Are you seven? <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You know, last time it was it was Connor, and Connor told us all he was eight, and his mom had to remind him that he was actually nine. Now. That's okay. You're mad, and you're you are definitely nine. Good. All right. Um, okay. I'm going to give you the most difficult job then, if that's okay with you. Luke, how good are you at standing still? Not that good. <laughs> We're still going to try it, okay? I bet you can do a pretty good job. I need you to come here. You can lean against the wall if you want. You can stand a little bit away from the wall. It's up to you. You don't have to stand perfectly still. Yeah, you're going to hold one end of this. And then when we get get across there, Laura's going to kind of grab it in the middle. And then we're going to go all the way up there. Okay, so. This is, of course, a Jamie Taylor Tower. Um, every sheet on here is 50 million years of Earth history. So starting at 4,450 million years ago, so it's 4.55 billion years ago, we formed the solar system. <coughs> The moon forms here after one sheet around 4,500 million years ago. The very oldest mineral we have on Earth, one tiny microscopic fragment of a crystal of a mineral called zircon in Australia. That's right, there's nothing in there. It's a really good observation, Luke. Right? Uh, you're going to find this happens quite a lot as we go through the Earth. No, we still you. There's plenty of history, just we don't know what it was. We are missing the world. I see a huge view in geology. <laughs> yeah. Alright, 4,200 million years ago, Earth's atmosphere formed, but no oxygen yet. So, if you build a time machine and you go back 4,200 million years ago, please take oxygen tanks with you, otherwise you'll have a very, very short visit. Uh, that's right, all the snow rocks on Earth, the Acastonites from the Northwest Territories of Canada. Um, I didn't bring that one with me today, um, but uh, I have one small piece of that. The only rock on Earth that's more than 4 billion years old. If you want to touch something that's even older than that, the meteorites outside, because they formed when the solar system formed 4.5 billion years ago. You will never touch anything that old ever so. again. Uh, the oldest known sediments, 3,850 million years ago from Greenland. Um, oldest known life, we have little evidence of uh, bacteria, little, these days, there's tiny smudges of carbon. Bacteria and algae. And then, okay, we don't know very much for a while. Uh, but then we get to about three billion years ago. And don't worry, this is this point, right? Don't worry about it. You hold on to that piece right there. Just right there. There we go, good job. I need you to come with me on the stage. Uh, yeah, now, how far is this? <laughs> Alright, so, 2,700 million years ago, we start to get a build up of atmospheric oxygen. Uh, at that time, the oceans contained a lot of iron, but as there was more oxygen in the atmosphere, that iron oxidized and precipitated out. And the iron formations you get in Minnesota uh, formed at that time. 
Now we're into the crucial result, two and a half million years ago. Now we're getting to 2,000 million years ago. And also there are some rocks from this time interval, but we don't know a whole lot about what was going on. Now we're into the middle crucial result. No, it's all more Lucas, I promise you. Okay, this is a cool one. So, um, how many of you have been to Johnson Shuttles or Albatross or that place like South East Missouri? Okay, so 1400 million years ago, there were super volcanoes in South East Missouri. So, Albatross is a little like magma chamber. Granite. Um, Johnson Shuttles, that's all volcanic rocks from various eruptions. Tall Salt, a base mountain in Missouri. Mountain. <laughs> um, but um, it's got a quite a scenic place. And the top of the Storm Sort is this purple rock called Rhyolite. Um, that is the product of an enormous volcanic eruption, just like Yellowstone. Alright, uh, oldest known, well, possible animals of 1.2 billion years ago is actually like belly prints. Only who knows what a belly print does something 1.2 billion years ago looked like. So, Maybe it's a belly print, maybe it's a funny ripple or something, we really don't know. Um, less than a billion years now, 800 million years ago, break up of the supercontinent Rodinia. That was the supercontinent before Pantheon. 700 million years ago, oldest known multicellular organisms. Also, um, slow ball earth. The earth is probably completely not a nice old pole at this time. There may have been a little bit of uh, not frozen stuff around the equator, but not much. Now we get to the Cambrian, 544 million years ago. We begin with the Mamera of Aeon and the Phoenix of Aeon. We get early shelled organisms. We have trilobites. 488 early fish. 450 early land plants. 400 insects. 350 reptiles and early trees. And the Tardiferous and also cold spots. 280 final assembly of the next supercontinent called Pangaea. It's the Mesozoic, the a Triassic mass extinction. The biggest one in Earth history. About 250 million years ago, the first dinosaurs of 215. The Atlantic Ocean begins to open at 200. Early birds and mammals at 150. We have early flowering plants. And right here, 65 million years ago, is the end of the dinosaurs and the beginning of the Cenozoic. And then this last sheet, kind of it, is the tertiary, uh, the tertiary so the Cenozoic. Early primates and early horses appearing right at the beginning of the last sheet. Australopithecus, one of the earliest ones, less than an inch from the end. And of course, the Holocene, 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 Alright, so now a big round of applause for my helpers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Alright. So, all my excellent helpers are uh, tidying up the big towel. It's going to come down, it's all going to get rolled up. And then at the end, you can roll Luke up in it as well, and we'll stuff him in this bag and give him back to his death. There we go. All right, so, uh, known impact craters on Earth. Uh, the red spots mark places where we know there are impact craters. So, what's missing? Do we get impact craters everywhere? Are there, are there places that are immune from impacts? Yeah? So, do you, do you see any red dots in the oceans, in the big blue areas? No! No. So, why is that? Oh, yes, there is one! You found one? I like to die. Oh, yeah, I see. All right, so why don't we have impact craters in the oceans? So there's a couple of reasons. One, of course, is if there was an impact in the ocean, we wouldn't necessarily know about it. 
Um, you know, it would, the crater would be obscured. Most of the ocean floor is not that well mapped. Hold on, Luke. If you want to just put it down, you can at this point. But, uh, um, so, the um, yeah, impact craters on the ocean floor, we actually have better, higher resolution topographic maps of the surface of Mars than we do of the seafloor of our own planet. So, um, you know, there may well be craters down there. Another reason, which is a bit more involved, is simply that because of plate tectonics, um, the oceans are very young. The oldest piece of oceanic crust is only 200 million years old, whereas the continents go back much older, up to three or even four billion years old. And so um, the oceans haven't been hit as much by, by meteorites anyway. But, um, so when we can see this if we look at the moon. So we actually use impact cratering a lot to determine the relative ages of different parts of the moon, Mars, Venus, and so on. So here you can see the southern highlands of the moon really, really heavily cratered. And these are very old. These are you know, close to four and a half billion years old. The lunar mare, the seas, which are in fact vast solidified lakes of lava, um, these are much younger, and you can tell that there's a few craters in them, but not many. And in fact, most of the lunar mare fill giant impact craters from early in the moon's history. So um, we, we use... Um, use crater counting for uh, relative dating of different surfaces. All right, next question. What are meteorites made of? Stone. Basically, yep, stone is one possibility. Uh, any other ideas? Iron. Right, so we've basically got stony meteorites, we have iron meteorites. Uh, how many of you got to see the palisite? That's my personal favorite piece that's out there. Um, anyway, that's a stony iron meteorite that is these big green olivine crystals in an iron nickel metal matrix. So it's, it's really cool looking. It's like the, uh, the, the big green crystals, if you cut a thin slice, it's like a stained glass window. Anyway. Well, Luke, this is a history of the solar system, a very brief one. So basically what most meteorites are made of is leftover pieces um, of the formation of the solar system. So top left, we have a nebula, a cloud of gas, which is what the solar system formed from, the remnants of exploding stars that formed elsewhere. This cloud of gas was spinning and formed clumps, and those clumps condensed and became planets, and those planets grew by capturing other pieces. And of course, that involved a lot of collision. So here is something that looks a bit like an asteroid, and then lots of pieces are kind of flying into that, that's now like the biggest thing around, so gravitationally it's sucking up all the other things that it flies near. Once you get big enough, you have all this energy from all these impacts, you actually start to melt, and so the bigger asteroids and the bigger planets started to melt and separate it out into a dense metallic core and a less dense rocky exterior. Um, and then one particular lucky planet got hit by this smaller planet called Thea, and this, of course, is the early Earth being hit by Thea. This huge impact took a whole bunch of Thea and a whole bunch of the outside of the Earth and eventually formed our moon. And so uh, our moon also formed by a giant impact. But some of these asteroids never did form into a planet. They formed the asteroid belt, which is found between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, and bits of that asteroid belt are still flying around. Um, and some of them... Uh, cross our orbit. So um, as of 2001, and obviously we've discovered a lot more since then, there were more than a thousand objects with a diameter of more than a kilometer um, whose perihelion, the closest they came to the sun, is, is uh, quite close to that of the Earth. Okay? So um, this, this shows a whole bunch of different asteroids. This is now quite an old figure, and one thing it's important to realize is just how many asteroids are being found every year. Really, it's only been the last 20 years that there's been a systematic effort to look for asteroids. The green ones here are asteroids that are relatively safe. The red ones are asteroids that come close enough to the Earth that they're considered potentially hazardous. So, this is... 
the Sun in the middle, yellow, and then Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, asteroid belt. So there's a lot of them. Um, what do they look like? This is Ida. Um, Ida is about the size of Boone County. And Ida is a very unusual asteroid in that it has a moon, its own little baby moon called Dactyl, right there. Um, so that's the first one that's, that's been discovered with its own satellite. And you can see that even this asteroid is itself covered with little impact craters. So the Earth can get hit by fragments of asteroid or by comets. What's the difference between a comet and an asteroid? Well, the asteroids are mostly found in the asteroid belt. Comets have orbits that take them way outside of the solar system, so the Kuiper belt or even the Oort cloud. Because they have such very, very long orbits, when they come into the, solar, into the inner solar system, they're traveling very, very fast. And many of them have such long orbital periods that we haven't seen them before. So we're constantly finding new comets that we didn't know about. Halley's Comet is a very well-known one. That has a period of 76 years. Um, but there are others. You know, that there are probably millions of comets out there, and we certainly haven't seen that many yet. So it has a rocky, asteroid-like center with a bunch of ice around it. And the reason we can see comets that look so cool is when they come into the inner solar system, they get heated up by the sun, and that ice ablates and evaporates, and we get a stream of dust particles shooting off it. Okay, so we have asteroids, and we have, um, and we have comets. And um, we sometimes get little bits of uh, the moon or of Mars as well. The only, reason, the only time we can get them landing on Earth is if something hit the moon or Mars hard enough to eject stuff from those bodies faster than their escape velocity. So for Earth, escape velocity is about 12 kilometers per second, which is really quite fast. Um, for the Moon and Mars, they're smaller, so it's not quite that fast. But still, the only thing that is going to eject material from those bodies to get them to the Earth would be something impacting them. So we have kind of this, you know, I know pinball going on in the solar system. Um, the Earth, of course, is differentiated into layers, crust, mantle, core, where the crust and the mantle are rocky and the core is metallic. And so um, I've also mentioned that the biggest asteroids have also differentiated. Now, whenever we find an iron meteorite, and there are a couple outside that you could look at, one is Canyon Diablo that uh, formed Meteor Crater in Arizona, that is the core of a planet that got destroyed early in solar system history. And you can hold that in your hand. I just think that's one of the coolest things. That had to be a body that was big enough to differentiate and form its own core. So that was not just some little asteroid. That was actually a planet. No longer exists. Um, so these iron meteorites have these crystalline patterns, and that's because they are, in fact, crystalline. They're crystals of metal rather than of silicate. Um, they contain um, iron and variable quantities of, of nickel. And one of the other iron meteorite outside, Gibeon, uh, has been sliced and etched with acid. And if you look closely past the countless fingerprints from elementary schoolers that have touched it over the years, there you can just about see the Wittmannstatten pattern, as this is called. Um, we can actually use the thickness of the crystals to say something about how fast this, uh, this molten iron solidified and crystallized. So this is what our core looks like, but you'll never get to hold a piece of our core. Nobody on Earth will. We can't get down there. Um, but you can hold the core of some other planet that no longer exists. All right, so let's say we get hit by something. What determines the size of the crater? Well, first of all, you need something moderately big, like at least the size of this room, possibly even this building, to actually make it all the way through and, and produce a crater. You can have you know, small pieces like we saw the Peekskill fireball and a baseball-sized piece made it through and hit that car. Uh, there was a case in uh, Chicago a few years ago um, where um, a, there were a few meteorites landed in one little neighborhood of Chicago, and there were some in the streets, some went through people's roofs. Um, but they were all small pieces. And they get slowed down a lot by friction with Earth's atmosphere and they heat up and that's why we see shooting stars. You, if you have bigger pieces though, they can make it through without slowing down so much and without, uh, without losing too much material to, uh, uh, to melting and so on. Um, and then we'll start to get a decent sized crater. So this is Meteor Crater in Arizona. 
probably caused by um, an impact at about 100 meters across. So about the size of Furrow Field, and it's made a crater that is three quarters of a mile across. Typically on Earth, the crater is about 10 times the size of the impactor, just as a very rough ballpark. Craters on land erode very quickly. So the reason this one looks so cool is it's young, and it landed in Arizona where there's really not a lot of stuff going on that would, that would uh, um, hide it. So there's really no flowing water around that would, that would mess it up. There's a bit of, there's some wind, it's the desert, but there's not a huge uh, sand dunes nearby or anything. Compare that with, um, oh, so there we go, Meteor Crater, 49,000 years old. Compare that with this one in Namibia, um, which is much older, 3.7 million years, and that's been basically filled up by blowing sand. This is twice as big as Meteor Crater, but um, doesn't look anywhere near as cool because it's now basically an enormous sand pit. A really good place to look at crater morphology is other planets, especially other planets that don't have, again, flowing water um, or, or vegetation. And as a geologist, you know, vegetation is my enemy, except that I'm grateful for, that it produces oxygen so I can breathe, but um, usually it just gets in the way of the rocks. So let's look at Mars, where we don't have the vegetation problem. Here's a nice simple crater, again, about the same size as the one we just saw in Namibia. We don't know how old this one is. It's fairly young. It's got a razor-sharp rim, this nice blanket of what we call ejector, the stuff that got blown out. Remember what that ejector looks like, because you're going to see something different in a few slides' time. Um, Mimas, moon of Saturn. So um, the Herschel crater on Mimas is 140 kilometers across. Mimas itself is less than 400 kilometers across. So it's basically, um, you know, the diameter of Mimas is Kansas City to St. Louis. And this crater in there, this was so big, this must have come close to uh, breaking it apart. There's an alternative hypothesis that that's no moon. That's, uh, anyway, not enough of you have watched enough Star Wars. Never mind. Um, all right. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. In this particular case, it is quite remarkable that that did not actually break up that moon. But uh, anyway. Uh, we won't worry about this, except just to say as impact craters get bigger, they start to get peaks and mountains that form in the middle. So here's one, UT on Mars that has a central peak. But there's another cool thing about this picture. So for the kids, what does this, like the science term for this is a multi-lobate ejector blanket. But if you look at that picture, what does that look like? What happened? Yeah. A flower. A flower, okay. So we have, right, so like different petals going in different directions. I like that. Would you say that this was a, an impact into dry material? Does this look like if you threw something into sand, or I don't know, flour and cocoa powder? Or does this look like something that was kind of wet? So when I, when I see this, I just think sploosh. That's what I think. I think this looks like when you throw a rock in a muddy puddle, and, um, and it went splat. So what's cool about this is that this is on Mars, and there is no water flowing around on the surface of Mars today. So, or, well, not today. There's probably been lava quite recently, but that's a whole other talk. You have to come back another time. Um, so, um, yeah, what probably happened here is that there was ice in the very shallow ground, and when the impact happened, it melted the ice, and so the stuff that got blown out was a mixture of, um, you know, Martian dirt and lava, rocks and stuff, um, but also a lot of water. So it ends up being a very wet deposit, which would then have frozen again. Um, but I just think that's very cool. A uh, bigger crater, this one's uh, you know, about 80 miles across, um, and we start to have a central peak and almost a peak ring, and we start to get, as they get bigger and bigger, we start to get a, a multi-ring basin. Here's a big one uh, from Quebec, Manicougan. Um, if you ever look at a, a map of the whole of North America, this one is big enough that it shows up on maps of North America. Um, you've got the ring, which is now a lake, and the big island in the middle. Um, that's a bit over 200 million years ago. 
This is the biggest one on Earth, the Breda Fort Dome in South Africa, uh, about 300 kilometers across, um, 2 billion years old, the largest and oldest uh, known impact structure on Earth. Um, the second largest, um, and not quite as old, but almost 1.85 billion years ago, is Sudbury in Ontario. And outside there are two rocks, one from actually the Sudbury crater itself, which has a whole bunch of interesting minerals in it, uh, and another one from Minnesota, which is the ejector from the Sudbury impact that traveled several hundred miles through the air. Some of it landed in Minnesota and formed a really jumbled up rock called a breccia, and we have a piece of that outside too. When you get to really big impacts, you get multi-ring basins. This is Callisto, which is the moon of Jupiter. This is the Valhalla multi-ring basin. This impact was so big, the whole moon was like going afterwards, um, you know, oscillating back and forth, and that caused these circular cracks in the outside. Um, and so these are up to 4,000 kilometers in diameter. So this is huge. Um, yeah. Of course, the biggest impact associated with the Earth, we don't see the impact crater because the Earth reformed afterwards. And that was the impact with Thea, uh, a small planet, probably about the size of Mars. Um, we know that this happened, by the way, because the Moon has almost no core. And the Earth has a bigger core than it ought to have. So the idea is that the core from Thea ended up going straight into the core of the Earth. And kind of the crust and mantle of Thea, along with some of the mantle of the Earth, ended up forming the Moon. This is going to the other end of the spectrum. This is a mini crater in a, um, a solar panel uh, recovered from the Hubble Space Telescope, less than half a millimeter across. So, yeah. But these cosmic dust particles, by the way, this, this is a hazard for astronauts, because um, these things are still traveling very fast. So. You know, if you're wearing a spacesuit, it's not much consolation that you got hit by a very, very small thing. If it's traveling at several kilometers a second, it's still possibly going to puncture your spacesuit. So. All right, um, we understand a lot about cratering from analog experiments. So, you know, part of the point of this evening is to emphasize that scientists do experiments. We play around with stuff in order to try to understand it. So, okay, if you're NASA, then you do a very nice multi-layered stratigraphy here, and then you shoot a projectile into it from big gun at a kilometer per second, and you see what happened. Um, if you're elementary school kids, then you, you know, do similar experiments, but without the gun, uh, and with flour and cocoa powder and cornmeal and so on. Um, but in either case, I want to emphasize, we can replicate some of the key features of actual impacts. If you look closely here at the rim of the crater, you get this overturned flat. So remember that the artist's impression of the KT boundary, the end of the dinosaurs, is this huge curtain of ejector going up hundreds of miles into the air. When the impact happens, stuff flies out of the crater, and some of it falls over and forms this inverted flat. We see this at Meteor Crater. We see this all over the place. Now, let's look at a couple of analog experiments. And this is from two years ago. Uh, the first time that we did this, this is actually from like two years and, and one month ago when we were really we were messing around at home trying to figure out whether this would even work. So um, there we go. That's that's an oblique impact, and um, you know at the end of it, right? We can see the uh, we can see that the flower layer that was hidden under the surface that's been exposed at the surface. Um, we got a little bit more. Having got over the initial excitement of just throwing things into the tray, we started being a little bit more rigorous. And of course, it's only science if you measure it and write it down. Otherwise, it's just playing. Uh, so we started measuring and writing things down. There's a ball bearing. Notice, there we go. There is a thin rim of flour around the outside. Okay. So this is our even this experiment. We dropped in a ball bearing. We have a little inverted flat where what was underneath the flower comes up and over and ends up on top. And that's the little white rim around that crater. So, you know, we learn things by doing, uh, by doing experiments. Uh, we got we really carried away with this last time and collected all kinds of data. Um, you know, we had marbles, we had golf balls, we were looking at different heights and crater diameters and so on. Or you can go to a textbook and you'll find this equation for uh, you know, the diameter of a crater with all these different variables about the density of the thing that did the impact, what angle did it hit at, and so on. But 
as you've come from, uh, from playing around with the experiments next door, you, know, you do simple things and then think about how could we modify it, what are other hypotheses we could, we could test by changing the way we set up the experiment and so on. Anyway, that's just my little plug for experimental science. Since I do lots of experimental science, mostly with lava rather than with flour and so on, but uh, it's fun. All right, uh, the last uh, question <coughs> before my voice gives out. How can we avoid being hit? Can we avoid being hit would be another good question. Anyway, as I mentioned a couple of times, we know so much more now than we did 20 years ago when, sh when the Schumacher-Levy impact happened on Jupiter. Um, there have been a series of different observing initiatives that have been funded by the government. And uh, basically, right after Schumacher-Levy, people started taking this whole thing seriously. Um, and the number of detected asteroids has increased so much since then. There are thousands and thousands that we know about now. And 20 years ago, we knew of only you know, a couple of hundred. I'm going to show you a little, another little animation. Um, this is of the, the near space environment around Earth for a period of one year. It's not going to take that long. It's going to take about 20 seconds. Um, only objects less than 20 million kilometers from the Earth are going to be plotted at all which is quite a long way. It's like 50 times the distance from the Earth to the Moon. Um, but anything coming within that range is regarded as being somewhat close to the Earth. Anything within one-third of that, within about 17 lunar distances, is going to be red. 17 to 34 is going to be orange. More than 34 is going to be green. Okay? Um, also, on the scale that we're showing it, the Earth would actually be much less than one pixel across. Anyway you'll notice at least 16 close approaches. So um, there's going to be a blue line, which is the Earth's orbit. The Earth is going to be a blue dot in the middle. And we're just going to focus on us as we travel around the sun, one full, um, one full revolution. OK, so that's us in the middle, the blue dot. Anything in red comes quite close to the Earth. And then there are periods, like there was one, and then yeah, right there, there's a whole bunch of them. They all come at once. And then things kind of calm down for a bit. It's calmer, it's calmer. Oh, there's like half a dozen all at once. And then there's a whole bunch right there. And then they start to move away again. Oh, no, another bunch. This was one year. You'll be this was like six years ago, so we survived. You'll be pleased to know. Um, <laughs> But the other interesting thing is that this, you know, this was um, from five, six years ago. We have discovered so many more asteroids since then. Most of those things would be pretty small, maybe the size of this room, maybe even smaller. Honestly, if they're much smaller than this room, we're not going to see them. They're, they're just too small. Um, and some of them would have been you know, the size of the building or the campus. But um, anyway, it's important to know that close approaches by asteroids happen very, very frequently. So this is all last week, right? There's about 10 on there. What we define as a close approach is a pretty conservative thing, though. Like, none of those are less than two and a half lunar distances away. So most of the time, these close approaches, they're like close enough that it's good that someone's paying attention, but they're not really, we're not really in any danger of being hit. The interesting exception to this was two years ago we did this talk. Um, it was the first, the first run through. And um, it was actually my birthday two years ago, there was a 400 meter diameter object that came within one lunar distance of the Earth. And this doesn't happen very often. This was quite exciting. Um, you know, if that were to hit, we would, we would know about it. That's definitely, that would take out you know, more than a city uh, with no problem at all. Um, so that was quite an exciting one. So, how do we deal with the problem? Um, there are basically two options for asteroids. We're not, gonna, we're not really going to talk about comets, because comets travel so fast, we have two problems. One is, we don't know that they're even there until, you know, we just don't have as much notice of a comet arriving. By the time we've seen it, it's traveling at maybe 70 kilometers a second. Um, you know, we don't get a whole lot of time. Also, because it's traveling so fast, it actually would be much harder to go with the deflection option. You would need to push it a lot harder, a lot quicker, to get it to move out of the way. 
asteroids you might be able to deflect. Or you can send Bruce Willis and the entire world's nuclear arsenal and, um, and a big drill uh, and Ben Affleck. Anyway, um, so at this point, I usually let people decide. Are we going to destroy it or are we going to deflect it? So who would vote for destroy? Usually all the boys put their hand up at this point. Anyway, okay. Uh, who would vote for deflect? All right, so... See, the last lot, which was a lot more of the elementary school than a lot less of the grown-ups, was they were about 50-50. But uh, anyway, so you guys are mostly on the deflect side. So um, let me just mention with the destroy option, I, I talk about this in class and we have another vote, which is let's say that there is an asteroid that would, that's going to hit Kansas choosing a rather unsympathetic target right here. But you've got to remember, if something hits Kansas, it's also going to, you know, it's, it's going to cause problems for us. Um, and it's big enough that, you know, this would be bad. A lot of people would die. Um, or we could try blow it up. And some fragments would hit Kansas, and some would hit Missouri, and some would hit Kentucky, and some would hit Europe, and some would hit China, and... You know, we'd basically spread the devastation, but no one area would be completely taken out. So then, which way do you vote? Do you take one for the team? Or do you just kind of, you know, do you, do you spread the devastation in the hope that Columbia, Missouri survives? So that's, uh, anyway. Let's not vote on that right now. You can, you can think about that on the way home. Um, so... Destroy versus deflect, of course deflect is the better option. Because if you blow it up, you're not going to suddenly get all the pieces to fly away from the Earth. You're just going to have a whole bunch of impacts hitting the Earth. Um, and you may, in fact, guarantee the devastation of the Earth um, by, by trying to destroy it. How do we deflect? Um, you can um, use something called a gravity tractor, which sounds like a really cool like, thing that an astronaut would drive around with like a big scoop on the front but it's not. It's really just a big, heavy lump. If you can get a big, heavy lump into space and park it next to the asteroid, the asteroid's gravity is going to pull this thing towards it. But this thing is also going to pull the asteroid this way, just a little bit. We don't have to deflect it very much. The Earth moves its own width along its orbital trajectory every seven minutes. Because we're traveling at 30 kilometers a second, even as we speak. So if you can just delay it by seven minutes, you've just saved the Earth. And if you know about this decades in advance, you can do this with a modestly sized mass and just park it next to the asteroid. And so that's what a gravity tractor is. Um, there are a variety of other more imaginative options as well, which I, you can talk to me about afterwards if you'd like. Um, in summary, um, I hope you either have or will play with the uh, with, with the stuff next door, that you have at least managed to touch um, a meteorite, um, the oldest thing you'll ever touch, and if you touch the iron meteorite, the core of a no longer existent planet. And I've tried to answer what I thought would be the four main questions. If you have any other questions, I'll be happy to deal with them now. Thank you very much. <laughs>